Um, let's uh, narrow a little bit towards our field of practice, communication disorders. And I, um, when I say what happened in the communication disorders world is the Brazilian world, what happens here? And it's um, interesting. First thing you need to um, uh, remind is that speech language pathology and audiology is a single course in Brazil and is done on the undergraduate level. And after graduate level, uh, a person can specialize in the area of her interest. So this is the page of the Brazilian Society of Speech Language Pathology and Audiology, which is similar to ASHA in the US. And the major areas that we work our language, hearing and balance, speech, oral function, so there comes swallowing, uh, the, uh, uh, um, mastication, um, sucking, and reading, writing, and learning. So those are the departments. Uh, and uh, I put a speech there, but it should be voice, okay? Uh, we do not have the area of speech. It's incredible. Don't, don't ask me uh, how and why. But uh, here in Portuguese, the areas of specialty that the Brazilian society of speech pathology has compared to ASHA. Okay, ASHA has 19 different special interest groups. And um, I, SIG uh, number five is the one that I'm always uh, brushing at. Um, and you have SIG 14, cultural and linguistic diversity. And we do not have that, um, um, that uh, uh, con not, not content. Uh, we do not focus on cultural and linguistic diversity during our preparation to be speech pathologist, uh, more cultural diversity, but let me go through with you and show you what we do. Uh, the uh, federal speech language pathology audiology board, we have a federal organization that uh, uh, rules all states it's not like in the US that each state has its uh, uh, board and that AUD is separate for SLP. We have a federal board and then we have the low, uh, uh, regionalized boards. They recognize 12 specialties. So audiology, dysphagia, uh, um, uh, fluency or uh, educational SLP, uh, working SLP, neurofunctional SLP, gerontology, language, oral motricity, neuropsychology is an area of the SLPs here, uh, collective health and voice. Um, the area that specifically mentions anything in their documentation uh, about bilingualism, because linguistic diversity is not uh, shown anywhere, uh, is educational speech language pathology, and the, uh, uh, they are uh, focusing on deaf bilingualism. So uh, uh, the learning of the Brazilian uh, uh, sign language, Libras, which is how we call, and Portuguese. That's all that is in our um, federal um, uh, uh, guidelines of uh, practice. If we look at the Brazilian code of ethics for practice, we find in uh, we find the uh, uh, the word cultural uh, diversidade cultural cultural diversity twice, but never linguistic diversity. And I call your attention that is the code of ethics of the speech language pathologist and audiologist. And there is no mention of linguistic diversity. Uh, if we go to the uh, core curriculum, what we are required by the Ministry of Education uh, to provide as coursework for the SLP and AUDs as they do the undergraduate work. Uh, again, uh, we have a um, uh, uh, core curriculum from 2002, uh, which is still working. And we see 
cultural diverse ones, linguistic diverse in never. And then we have a new core curriculum, which is not implemented yet, is in the final level, is at the desk of the Minister of Education to approve, so it will change. Here you see uh, five times, again, cultural diversity, but it spans. Now they talk about sociocultural, historical, regional diversity. They talk about ethnic, racial, gender, uh, geren, 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 generational, generational, yeah, age, um, and uh, uh, handicaps, diversity. They talk about other aspects, however, and they conclude that and they don't say no, linguistic they don't diversity, know. but they say that other aspects uh, that are included in the human diversity, so we can interpret that linguistic diversity can be enclosed in this new core curriculum, which is not implemented yet. Okay, some of my students are connecting, and uh, I, they. Yeah, they, I'm gonna. I'm going to um, mute them as they come in, uh, yes. or you can tell them to 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 mute as they come in. What I found interesting as I read uh, uh, this new core curriculum is that it is um, suggested the importance of a second language for the SLP AUD. So that, but. The, the emphasis is not in a uh, 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 in relation to linguistic diverse populations is for as an instrument to learn to go in the literature and to learn new technologies. So what I'm pointing out to you is that we still a long way to go to finally have a class a course like the one you have with Dr. Linda Rosalugo. And we do have migrants, immigrants in my country. Um, in the last 10 years, uh, many uh, uh, Venez Venezuelans, many Haitians uh, have come. Um, um, a, a lot of people asked to come uh, as immigrants to, Bra to uh, Brazil. So we have uh, from the Middle East, a lot of uh, um, immigrants. However, uh, they go to our schools and to these people, the burden is on them to learn Brazilian Portuguese. So we still in a stage that perhaps Linda, the US was what, 40, 30 years ago? Um, yeah. So we, we will really benefit from this partnership. I'll get there. Uh, if you go to Google, I just did a simple Google, and I look at bilingualism and speech disorders. Uh, there is still a lot of um, misunderstanding. Uh, these are not uh, scientific journals, but these are uh, um, uh, sites that families go to talk to somebody and that talk that bilingualism, look at here, and is in Portuguese, but let's try to interpret it, bilingualism can cause language development delay. Okay, so this is a lot of uh, uh, information about this. Uh, we do have some literature in the teaching of Portuguese as a second language to deaf children. So we now have a group that accepts sign language as the first language in Portuguese as their second language. It used to be the other way around. So they have to learn oral, like, uh, an oral language first. And otherwise they will not, if they learn sign language, they will not learn uh, uh, the oral language. Now this is changing a lot. Um, there are some things uh, in here, you can look at some articles in which bilingualism is posed as the 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 uh, villain, uh, the uh, the bad guy, right. uh, in, in which uh, it, it's called. Let me see if I find the phrase here. I should have um, here. It it was uh, with the evaluation. It was seen that the um, uh, the communicative intention was present. However, the the 
a simple language delay had bilingualism as cause. So this is a case report. Uh, uh, however, even in the way they report, and this is not a very old article. Now I I, uh, I didn't leave the, uh, um, I think it's 2008. Um, so we still have to, to uh, um, we, still have, we still have a long way to go, uh, but we have the other way around too. Here we have an, uh, uh, an article that talks about the role of SLP and does not pose the bilingualism as uh, the bad guy. And on the contrary, it says at the end here that bilingualism did not bring, uh, uh, Com That's did not compromise the, the communicative abilities of Portuguese. So um, therefore, if we take a broad look, and this is, was a broad look into linguistic and cultural diversity, as we look at these aspects in our uh, uh, speech pathology practices in, in Brazil, um, we still have to uh, increase our knowledge about cultural and uh, linguistic diversity uh, from the SLP and AUD perspective. And this we need to, to see changes in our core curriculum and ethics code. Um, uh, and then we will know that our community is really understanding and, and doing something to change uh, this reality. We need to address linguistic and cultural prejudice and um, we need to learn from the history of the speech pathology, although it's lacking speech pathology and audiology in Brazil here. And um, the speech pathology was practiced before it became a, a, a profession in the, in the 70s and was practiced in the schools for the deaf. And then the profession started organizing and we had um, uh, the first uh, um, recognition by the uh, government in 1981. Uh, but at that time, and I started uh, school in 1982, so soon after uh, the profession was recognized nationally, um, I started studying speech language pathology. And in my time, if you had a uh, linguistic variation, or if you had a speech problem, it could be lisping, or if you stutter, uh, you, uh, in some schools, you could not become a student, and you could, not, in others, you would become a student, you would be offered treatment, but you would not graduate until you resolve your problem, okay? So we need to learn from this. Uh, it changed a lot. Uh, it's still, uh, People ask, and I experienced this in first, uh, uh, um, I, we say in Brazil, I experienced this in my skin. When I went to UF, my English was worse than it is now, and it's rusty. For, for, for a professor, it is rusty, it should be more fluent. However, 20 years back in Brazil, I still speak English that you can understand. But when I got to UF in the um, late 80s, I started, because of my experience in Brazil in this big craniofacial center, I started working as a uh, um, assistant student to Dr. Ken Bizoc. And after a while, he said, let's split because the, the clients stayed in rooms and the clinicians from all healthcare areas would go through the rooms. After a while of working with him, he said, you can do what I do. Go to half of the clients. I go to the other half. Then we compare notes and we go together to the ones we think we want to uh, we wanna talk. So when I started going alone, many parents would, uh, would look at me with my accent would, and would say, where is Dr. Ken Bizon? And I would say, oh, he's coming shortly. I'm going ahead and doing the assessment. So then I would ask the clients with my accent to repeat the words that we need to see how the Villa for Geovolve is working. And uh, the parents would say, uh, not all of them, of course, many of them would wait for Dr. Bizoc and they would ask me that I should bring Dr. Bizoc there later. 
but some of them would look at me and say, I don't speak, we don't speak this way. So I would turn to them and say, yes, I have a heavy accent, but I can, uh, I, I, um, he, you can help me. So how do you say this word? Can you say, yes, now your turn, I would say to the child. Now you say like your mom or your dad or your brother or, uh, and, and don't say like me. And Dr. Bizoc would come to confirm, I, I think rarely we would disagree, uh, both on resonance and articulation. However, many parents, many, many parents were very uncomfortable with my English proficiency. And um, I, I believe it, and, uh, I, I believe this, I haven't changed. However, years later, when I work at um, Atlanta Healthcare, uh, Showa, uh, Children Healthcare of Atlanta, um, I used to go and work alone and uh, Dr. Jay Whiskey, which was my partner, he used to tell parents, she is not my student, she's my partner. And she'll be the one doing the speech therapy for your child. And um, of course, my accent did not impact whatever I need to do with the child to improve intraoral pressure, to learn, to make uh, the child learn how to move uh, the villopharynx uh, uh, in a different way. Uh, but uh, in Brazil, I would not be uh, um, uh, offered a job like that, considering the history that we had still now. I would not be a offered a job like I had uh, uh, in Atlanta or at uh, Gainesville. So I tell you this because I really believe that implementing partner partnerships with programs that board, broaden the perspective regarding cultural and linguistic diversity, like the, this course that Linda is hosting, bringing me here, allowing my students to hear uh, uh, and interact with your students, Linda, is very important. And um, I hope we can give your students um, um, the perspective regarding management of craniofacial anomalies Perhaps in the future, I don't know how long we have today, but uh, we're gonna stop here because I want you to make a reflection and I want to open the microphones for us to talk a little bit. And then if we still have time, I will present briefly a, a, pay, a case. Um, and it's important. And I learned this through my own experience and through working uh, uh, abroad in another country and then with working with clients that have severe speech uh, disabilities, they are unintelligible. And, um, but some of my clients here in Brazil, um, they do still keep some of their disorders and uh, they got to a point that is speaking the way they speak uh, which disorders are mean? They may still have mild hypernasality. So they might speak a little bit like this with a little bit of too much uh, oral re uh, nasal resonance, but they are comfortable with that. And they decided that they got enough surgeries, enough treatment. And I have um, um, lawyers, I have teachers, uh, I have uh, dentists that have cleft palate and they, they do have a little bit of uh, um, hypernasality. And to them, that is diversity. And they think that that doesn't affect the way they perform in the world. On the other hand, if you are unintelligible, then there is, um, there is nothing you can do to keep up conversation. You do need a speech language pathologist. You do need a team for uh, um, uh, diagnosis and, and management. Do you agree with me, class, future SLPs or I think SLPs need the no way you these, right? Yes, let, let, me, let me just um, frame this because I really do want the students, if you have a question, uh, it's really important because it is a different perspective. And I think um, a couple of things, a couple of points. So um, Dr. Dukas' students um, 
they they are in and I don't I don't know if you mentioned this. They come out of the College of Dentistry or um, well. uh, here uh, here at this campi we are in the College of Dentistry, but in another uh, USP SLP program they are in a College of Medicine. In another college, uh, um, um, one of my colleagues I don't know if she connected that she's from the a state university, uh, they are in the College of Humanities. So, so that's, I, I think that's important in terms of what colleges they function in. Um, Dr. Duca is correct. The cranial facial is an extremely large enterprise. Um, how many states are there in Brazil? That's the other thing I wanted to make sure that they understood. 27 states plus our uh, capital. Okay. So they, I mean, Brazil is as large as the United States, except that we have Alaska. So that's how large um, the country of Brazil is. And there are many different uh, dialects, for example, and I always tell this story, uh, Dr. Dukas, uh, uh, some of the students there, they do uh, go to different states, one of them being Rodonia. Is that the- uh, uh, Rodonia, Rodonia. Rodonia, and so, there is much more, um, not as uh, much services as there might be in Sao Paulo, because Sao Paulo is a city. That is like double New York City, okay? So it's a very urban, and um, Puerto Rodonia is where really they take students. Um, I think that they have either gone by bus or train or, I don't know, airplane, um, and she could tell you a little bit more about that. Um, that was an experience I would have loved to have the students uh, do, except Dr. Dukas does say that I'm very fussy because my thing is if I don't have a hair blower or I can't wear high heels, uh, Dr. Rosalugo is not going. Go ahead. Um, heels. We have a, um, a, a, some classes that we teach in another state which is uh, by the Amazon um, uh, jungle, but uh, we do have to travel by bus, two days by bus to get there. When we get there, we, we may get to a boat and go stopping on the little uh, villages to offer SOP and dentistry and now medicine, because now we have the uh, medical school here to offer services. This, this population during the COVID years that we haven't done, we do to our missions twice a year. Uh, Linda is talking about this because she's been invited to go, but uh, uh, sometimes there is no AC. Imagine Florida with no AC. If you're used to have an AC, you, you're doomed. You will be under the shower and there, you don't need electricity because the water is warm. Yes. But um, we do hold uh, this program for two years. We haven't gone. And um, it was our um, uh, desire that when the students came physically to the camp, that they could join one of these missions that really takes two weeks. And uh, we do assessment in all these villages. Uh, we provide hearing um, uh, prosthesis uh, for deaf. So sometimes we do the molding and do, do all the tests and then we send it to Sao Paulo for finishing up and then we send it back there, sometimes on the other mission. So it keeps a lag of six months until you fit the uh, hearing aid. Um, we do speech therapy and then in the broad scope of practice. So of course, when I go, I do everything that's related to speech disorders related to uh, velopharyngeal dysfunction. But we have um, a partner program of the aphasia house that we did with UCF, uh, Dr. Janet. I don't know if these classes have met. I don't her. know Dr. Whiteside, but how many here have been in the aphasia house? How many? So, so you can see all. And so uh, Dr. Whiteside and, 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 and I, I we went I and we partnered. Know. And so um, USPE here, they have the first international aphasia house. And that was an initiative that they had with Dr. Whiteside and our clinic um, at UCF. And we are extremely 
proud of our partnership. Uh, we continue that partnership in terms of writing articles. And um, uh, the other thing that I just wanted to, to make sure, Dr. Duca, is that they understand that if we have um, persons that come to the United States from Brazil that have um, prepared there, they are prepared in speech language pathology and audiology. Uh, phonoaudiologia, you know, um, is uh, what, yeah, th their name is a little bit different, but they are duly certified at the bachelor level. And then the master's level is where they then um, specialize. Uh, and I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to get into the kinds of, the kinds of institution, because uh, when she talks about, um, uh, it's an issue of privilege, and, and that's a whole nother lecture in terms of um, do the students pay tuition where, where you are, Dr. Duca? They do no, not. Not Can a you just say something person? about that? We, we do have uh, private universities in Brazil too, but we have many uh, uh, state and federal universities in which students don't pay anything. It's very hard to get to them. It gets very competitive. And uh, so this is one big difference with the US. Our um, um, elementary, middle and high school is very bad. So if you go to a public elementary, middle, high school program or school, you do have very little chance to get to a public university. And it's inverted. In the US, you invest on elementary, middle and high school, everybody can go to a great, my children studied in great schools over there. And when I came back to Brazil in 2002, after 15 years in the US, I, I said, no, I need to try. I need to put my kids in a public school. It is going to work. And they were in the elementary school and six months. And they would come home and I would, I would talk to them. What did you learn today? And they would look, my youngest one was very feisty. She would say, nada, mamãe, nada, nada. Prendi nada. Entonces, so it's different. And uh, that's the reason why we have money from public university. Okay. And, and I, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you said something, let me see if I can remember that I wanted to uh, comment. But why don't we hear the students? From the students. Well, uh, let me just ask you, Dr. Flores, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the tour, not the tours, the service that is giving at, at this places that you go to, um, is an educational component included in terms of the family? You know how sometimes you have a disease and a lot of the stress, a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the feelings and emotions that come from the side of the patient come down and decrease. If the, if the physician explains where things come from and how, how they got to the level that they are in terms of a disease stage or, or you know how, how bad it became, how aggressive a cancer is, um, the more they understand it, the more they can or the e a little bit easier it is for them to accept what they have and kind of be more predisposed to kind of do whatever is in their hands to improve and get better. So um, are, are, are these patients that, that you, you know, that you treat also educated to help them understand you from the physician side or from, you know, from your group side or the students? You made, you made an excellent observation and uh, um, we do uh, work with the understanding, and I'm going to talk now about the cleft lip and palate, uh, which is my area of expertise. We work with the parents since the first day of the consultation. We work in teams, so the, usually uh, the MD, the dentist, and the speech, but then the psychologist and the other areas uh, keep coming as the patient keeps returning to the center. So the patient comes as a 30, 30 days old and during the first year of life, he will do uh, the first two major surgeries, which is repair of lip in primary palate and then repair of secondary palate or, or whatever the timing of surgeries that the, the team decided. During this first year, uh, the uh, parents, when they come in the first 30 days are very concerned about feeding. 
uh, we usually have already talked to the um, uh, team at the hospital where, where the baby was born. They contact us. Uh, we have material that we share. And when the child continues uh, as a failure to try, we can bring them earlier to the hospital. And then the parents need to understand what is happening so they can uh, um, uh, provide for them at home, learn how to adjust the uh, utensils, how to adjust posture. And um, we do develop a lot of one-to-one uh, -one communication, but many manuals, many videos, uh, um, they are in Portuguese, but um, we'll be happy to share with you guys. So as the child grows, uh, and, and passes the feeding uh, difficulties, uh, we start working with the hearing, language, and speech development, and um, knowledge about the overall treatment. So, uh, and, and we don't give parents too much in this first year of life unless they ask. Uh, we talk more about the present, what's going to happen unless they start asking uh, major questions about, uh, uh, is my child going to have babies with cleft? Or is my child uh, uh, be able to marry? Uh, to marry? Is my child uh, uh, with a cognitive impairment and he will not learn in school? Then we start bringing in uh, 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 the, gen uh, well, the geneticist, the, the baby, but we bring in for counseling, we bring the psychologist, um, um, the uh, uh, we call uh, educational counselor uh, that usually helps with school, and and there it goes. So yes, we we have to go um, uh, teaching and sharing uh, information as we go. Otherwise, parents do not do what we ask them to do. Very Great. good pointed, Dr. Flores. Thank you, Mackenzie. Did you have any? Question, Alexis, you know, I'll call on you. Nobody saw a child with cranial facial anomalies? Anybody? They haven't taken the elective. They've taken this Faja. Um, cleft palate for us is an elective course but that's taught by Lakshmi. But and in schools, not... Linda, in schools, these children go to regular school. The... Right, but here's, here's, and I think this is the difference um, you know, with the preparation of our SLPs here, that I think in the United States, and Dr. Flores, I know that you also work with uh, children with genetic, uh, you know, issues and stuff. Many of the children, and you know, coming from Atlanta and the Risky Center, they are um, treated very early. They're treated very, very early. Whereas, for example, I think that the students that go to Brazil, they see um, your patients, they, uh, babies, but we also saw them older because you have an intensive, much like the aphasia house, you have an intensive program that brings families from all over Brazil. So uh -huh. they descend at, at your site and they come from all the states. So some of those patients might they be 14 years old, 13 years old, yeah, but and they are not, they are not repaired. Am I correct? Yes. And you are being very polite right now because we also have 30%. Let's say, let's be a little better because in the last five to 10, 10 five to 10 years, we improved, but uh, uh, we have between 20 and 30% of our babies who get villopharyngeal dysfunction after, after primary repair. If they, and they come now, now it changes, but they used to come from all over Brazil. So imagine you're in Florida and you're seeing a patient from Seattle. So the likelihood that this child will miss a surgery or will miss an appointment is huge. Now we have, uh, we have changed that. The government changing that, thank, thankfulness, Thank you, but we do have um, uh, teams that are not well prepared. So when they, they get their cases that have villopharyngeal dysfunction, uh, then they have to look for a center with more experience. But in the US, when I was at UF in, and I left the UF in 2000, no, 1990, 
eight I was at UCF. So until 1997, UF had 14%. And we still, let's say our best case is 20% of problem. UF in the 90s already had 14% only. Today, one of the best surgeons uh, um, uh, in the US have 5% problem. So you have very few patients that return. If you do not correct, if the child does not have the anatomical, uh, 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 the structural conditions to develop no normal speech, normal hearing, they will develop speech disorders. And that's what happened in Brazil. And then if they are in a state that does not have a speech pathology program, we have like a deaf Asia house, an intensive speech program, which treats the neurocognitive, not by us with the psychologist. So learning, we address learning and speech. They do four therapies daily for three weeks. So these children and adults will do 45 sessions in three weeks. If they are in the government program in their cities, they will do that in one year, maybe less. So we, in, in three weeks with this program, we can provide, of course, many patients might need to return to more modules of intensive therapy, but this is something that we can uh, uh, discuss um, uh, perhaps in another class. I don't know how much time I have to show a case, but. Well, uh, you know what might be nice? Um, Ashley has a question and then maybe um, we said until about 3.15. Uh, so we have about uh, 20, 20 minutes, give and take, you know. Um, you could probably show uh, Dr. Duca because um, I know that you have so much uh, information. Um, so that they can get an understanding of the cleft palate because they are a group that has not taken the course. But Ashley, what is the question? Um, it wasn't necessarily a question. You had asked about us seeing clients that had a um, cleft palate. Uh, Raina and I actually did an eval last semester in the clinic of a child that we found out had a bifid uvula. So we actually got a chance to see that and eval her, um, and she most likely had a submucous cleft. So that was kind of cool to see. It's very interesting. Yes. Yeah. And uh, sometimes they have no, uh, there, are, there is the occult submucous cleft. So you look at the mouth, there is no signs, but you still hear hypernasality and uh, have nasal air emission. So it's very, very interesting. Let me share with you one case. Okay. Um, briefly. Okay. I, guys, I have little time. And while you have that, while you have that Dr. Dukka, I just want to say welcome. Welcome to uh, your students. I see them here. Um, so um, thank you for coming in. I'm sorry a little bit about the time change, but I'm glad that you uh, are here with us. Obrigada, meus estudantes queridos, por estarem presentes. 